I moved away from my hometown a few years ago. My father had committed suicide when I was a small boy, going out to the barn and shooting himself in the face with a shotgun. I barely remember him still. The only thing that stays with me from that day was my mother's agonized, racking sobs when she found his mutilated body. Sometimes, during nightmares late at night, I still hear those same screams, repeating over and over like a skipping record. My little brother Charlie was born with Down syndrome. My mother took care of Charlie by herself since I moved away. I rarely talk to my family, something I feel increasingly guilty about looking back. Unbeknownst to me, my mother had a worsening addiction to pills and alcohol. To this day, I don't know if she intended to kill herself or not. But after examining her corpse, the medical examiner concluded that she had a lethal combination of benzos, morphine and vodka in her system. When they found her body rotting in the summer heat in her bedroom three days later, they said she had one eye half open, her arm still outstretched towards the telephone as if trying to call for help, even in death. The police ended up finding my number a few days later. I lived over five hours away, but when I heard Charlie was being kept at the police station, I immediately took the day off of work and headed back towards my hometown of Frost Hollow. I remember driving through the rural town, a place of rolling hills and thick, dark forests, thinking how dead and empty the whole area looked. A lot of the houses that had been there when I was younger had since been demolished or lay, barren, dilapidated and rotting. The police station in the centre of town seemed to be one of the few places still open. I looked at the shuttered windows lining both sides of Main Street, seeing one out-of-business sign after another. On the bright side, however, there were plenty of parking spots along the cracked, empty streets. I got out of the car, seeing a feral, mange-covered dog ripping through bags of garbage in a nearby alleyway. The sickly sweet smell of decaying trash filled the air, thick and cloying. I entered the glass doors of the police station, finding an old crone pecking at a keyboard behind the front desk. She looked like a twisted dwarf, her eyes magnified to giant orbs behind her glasses. She looked up at me with a pale, bloodless face. Yes, she said in an annoyed voice. I'm here to pick up Charlie Benton, I said. The old woman looked behind her where a tanned woman in a police officer's uniform was leaning against a rusted metal cabinet, looking through a file. Sergeant Alvarez deals with that, the old woman spat, looking back at her computer. The police officer sighed, looking up at me with humorless eyes. A few moments later, she circled around, coming out the tinted black glass door around the side. The slow, erratic typing of the old woman continued ringing out like the ticking of a failing heart. Sergeant Alvarez had wide, almond-shaped eyes and jet-black hair pulled back in a ponytail. She did not look happy to see me. "'You're Dennis?' she asked. I nodded, pulling out my license. She inspected it closely before handing it back to me. "'We found your brother in quite a state. He was covered in blood, naked from the waist up, wandering through people's backyards at night.' When the police found him, at first he was unresponsive, as if he was sleepwalking or something. His eyes were open, but he was not talking and appeared to be looking at things only he could see. After about 30 seconds of this, they said he appeared to wake up, though he still wasn't giving coherent answers at first. He just kept saying, she was walking, she was walking. Eventually, after a lot of trying, they were able to ask him about why he was wandering at night and why he was covered in injuries and blood. Your brother said something kept hurting him in the house at night and that he had to get out. He had marks on his body, Sergeant Alvarez said, her eyes suspicious. Intelligence gleamed behind them. The strangest thing, it looked like someone had burned hand marks into his back and shoulders. I found this information disturbing on some instinctive, primal level, but I didn't know why. Who could have done that? I asked, confused. She shrugged. 
Charlie couldn't tell us, she said. Your mother had been dead for three days by that point, and the wounds on Charlie's body were fresh. Do you know if there was anyone else who regularly visited or lived in the house with them? I shook my head. My mother had no friends, I said. She was practically a hermit. She used to just stare out the window for hours when I lived there like a zombie. No one ever came to visit her. The black doors swung open again, and Charlie stood there next to a muscular police officer. Charlie's face had his typical vacant stare. Charlie appeared in his mid-twenties, a sweaty, lumpy mass of a human being wearing a tight pinky and the brain t-shirt. His enormous belly hung over his belt, his shirt seemingly always pulled up to expose a few inches of naked flesh. He had confused, mud-brown eyes that rarely focused on anything for longer than a few seconds. But there were other times Charlie seemed to have an almost photographic memory, repeating entire conversations in his strange, droning monotone even months after they had taken place. She is dead, he said, his muddy brown eyes unfocused. She is dead. She was walking. I squinted at him, feeling cold dread dripping down my heart. Charlie, buddy, it's okay now, I said, taking a step towards him. He looked up abruptly, seeming to just now realize that I was there. Dennis, he screamed, his enormous belly jiggling as he ran forward. He wrapped his thick arms around me, his face filled with an innocent, childlike excitement. He lifted me off the ground. A breathy exhalation of fetid breath hit me directly in my face. I grunted as he squeezed the air out of my lungs. Charlie was immensely strong and often didn't realize his own strength. You're crushing me, buddy, I grunted in a small, crushed voice. Charlie dropped me back down on the ground. I looked closer at him, seeing healing, sickly wounds peeking above the neckline of his T-shirt. A rainbow of black, purple, and blue marks hung there, formed in the shape of long, twisted fingers. The worst of them had drops of pus falling from the burnt craters in the center. I wondered how many more lay hidden beneath his clothes. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Sergeant Alvarez gave me her card, telling me to call her if I found out any more information about the case, or if Charlie remembered anything, or was able to give more information in the future. I wondered who could have possibly been hurting Charlie. It made me feel sick and angry, thinking of someone following him around, scaring him and attacking him during the night. Charlie already hated and feared the dark as it was, adding another layer of cruelty to the disturbing case. He had feared it ever since he was a small boy. I walked him out of the police station, buckling him into the passenger seat of the car. As I sat down in the driver's seat, he looked over at me. Sweat glistened on his upper lip, and his goofy bowl cut of a haircut was sticking up in random spots. Dennis, I saw her, Charlie said in his flat monotone. She was walking. At night, I heard her feet. In the dark, I heard her feet. Who was, buddy? I asked. Who did that to you? Did someone hurt you during the night time? He nodded. A single tear fell from his squinty eyes, dripping down his round face. It wasn't Mom? He shook his head in response. His lips started quivering. He leaned close to me, whispering in a hoarse, terror-stricken voice. The bone-faced woman, he hissed, breaking down in tears. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. I had contacted a team to remove the soiled items in the master bedroom after receiving a call from the police. The team told me it would be a fairly easy job and that I would be able to stay in the house later that night. With no other living family except Charlie, I would undoubtedly inherit it anyway, though I had absolutely no intention of keeping it. I wanted to sell it as soon as possible, but I would have to go through everything and decide what, if anything, I wanted to keep. All of Charlie's stuff was also still in the house, which I knew we would need to go through and package regardless. It was a Friday, 
and I had the weekend off work. My plan was to finish moving everything out of my mother's house that weekend. Charlie and I pulled into the sprawling property that night, turning onto the flat, dirt driveway towards the old colonial. Sharp stones crunched rhythmically under the tires. I took in the sight, the large windows and wraparound porch of the dark purple house. I saw my childhood neighbour, Sloane Herbick, standing outside on his front lawn. Behind him loomed his Victorian house, a blood-red building of sharp turrets and dark, dusty windows. Sloane Herbick was a strange man in more ways than one. He had been burned horribly as an infant in a crib fire, barely surviving with his life. Melted folds of lumpy scar tissue covered most of his body, including his face and head. Miraculously, he hadn't lost his eyesight, nose or lips, but both of his ears were missing, as well as all the hair on his head, except his long, black eyelashes. His horrifyingly scarred body looked nearly as pale as an albino's, but his eyes were as dark as sin. I remembered Sloane as an arrogant, aloof man with no friends, about ten years older than myself. According to what my mother told me as a teenager, Sloane's mother had gone missing when I was little, during the time when they were constructing our then brand new home in Frost Hollow. By now, I thought, he must be at least forty, though the keloid scars and mutilated ridges of flesh running over his entire body made it impossible to tell. As I got out of the car, I gave a neighbourly wave, but Sloane ignored me. He stared fervently down at the hole, slamming the sharp tip of the shovel into the earth over and over again at a frenetic pace. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. I walked by Charlie's side up the rickety wooden steps to the front porch, pulling the spare house key out of my pocket from so many years ago. With trembling fingers, I slid the key into the lock, finding that my keys still worked, as I knew they would. The door opened onto a dark, sinister hallway. A nauseating odour emanated from the house, blowing out the front door like the rancid breath of some primordial monster. It was the smell of rotting bodies, clotted blood and infection. It left a slightly sweet aftertaste. Gagging, I flipped on the light switch. I took a step forward, but Charlie didn't follow. He stared up at me with an unusual intensity, taking his huge, round arms and crossing them over his chest. The front of his dirt-caked sneakers came up the perimeter of the threshold, but he refused to go any further. He just shook his greasy, sweat-covered face. Come on, buddy, I said encouragingly, giving him a wide smile. What's wrong? He pointed behind me, down the hallway. I instantly looked over my shoulder, my heart leaping up like a jackrabbit. Having watched far too many horror movies, I expected to see some blood-streaked hag standing there with a face like a skull and an ear-to-ear -ear grin. But the hallway lay empty. She's still here, Charlie said slowly, his eyes giant glassy orbs of terror. She is dead. Mum's not here, buddy, I answered, ambling back toward him and taking one of his enormous hands in mine. I could feel the width of it, the smooth flatness of his palms except for one thick ridge. Mum's at the funeral home. We're going to see her Sunday, remember? Charlie shook his head again, his hair flying everywhere. This place is bad, he said. We've got to stay here for the weekend, Charlie, I responded, feeling a rising sense of irritation. I already explained it all to you. The house is fine. They took the dead body out already, so what's the problem? You'll be with me the whole time. It will be bad, Charlie said, sweating heavily. It won't be scary, buddy, I promise. Looking back, it is hard to imagine any more untrue words than those. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Much of the stuff from my mother's room had been taken out by the cleaning team. They told me that some of her fluids had burst from her body, staining the mattress and bed frame with their black rot. Luckily, not much had gotten on the floor, but a small puddle had dripped down. 
The guest bedroom was directly underneath Mum's room, just a small, square room on the first floor with a bed, a dresser, and a TV. I kept the bedside lamp on all night. On the ceiling of the room, there was a Rorschach ink blot of dead, rotted fluids that still needed to be cleaned up. It was about the size of a basketball and looked like an eye. It had a dark, circular spot in the center, followed by thin, black tendrils that cracked their way towards the oval perimeter of the stain. Charlie crawled into bed next to me, putting a heavy, hot hand on my shoulder before falling asleep almost instantly. But I couldn't sleep. After what felt like an eternity, I looked over at the red lights of the alarm clock, seeing it was 3.32 a.m. I swore under my breath, sensing that my insomnia would not leave me alone this weekend in this place of horrors. At exactly 3.33, a jarring mechanical shrieking started outside. I jumped up in bed. Charlie awoke instantly. He sat up so fast that he smacked his head on the wall with a dull bonk. What the fuck is that noise? I hissed, jumping out of bed. I looked up at the stain as I went, giving it a distrustful glance backwards. The mechanical caterwauling seemed to be growing louder as I made my way toward the front of the house. I went to the front window, seeing Sloane Herbick running a wood chipper next to his totally dark house. I could just barely make out his dull silhouette, hearing the din of the constant grinding. Charlie gave an incomprehensible scream in the guest bedroom. I heard his heavy footsteps running toward me. His face was red and flushed, his pupils dilated and frantic. The eye moved! he said, his voice having more emotion than I had heard in it in a long time. I blinked, the fog of sleep still clouding my mind. You mean the stain? I asked, finally figuring out what he was talking about. The stain on the ceiling? He nodded ferociously, bobbing his head up and down quickly. Eventually, I ended up talking Charlie down and getting him back to bed. The stain was still in the same spot as far as I could tell. Around 4 a.m., the sound of the wood chipper finally died. In the eerie silence of the dark house, I fell into a nightmarish fever dream where I saw women bound with chains in a basement surrounding a mannequin wearing a suit made of human skin. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The next morning, I went over to Sloane's house and knocked until he answered. While I waited, I studied the strange gargoyle knocker plastered across the scarlet door. At first, he would only crack it open a fraction of an inch, staring out at me with a single emerald green eye. Can you not run the wood chipper in the middle of the night? I asked, giving him a faint, anxious half-smile. It's keeping me and Charlie from sleeping. I mean, you had the thing going at 3 a.m. last night. A few heartbeats later, the front door flew open. Sloane took a step towards me until his scarred, alien face stood only inches from mine. It's because of my skin, isn't it? He asked in a hoarse, low voice. He spoke in a strange cadence, mumbling the words in dissonant rhythms. If someone cut your eyes out so you couldn't see how ugly I am, you wouldn't care about the wood chipper anymore, would you? I took a step back the smile peeling off my face. I reached for the canister of police mace in my pocket, gripping it firmly and putting my hand on the trigger. Sloane, that has nothing to do with that, I answered coldly, narrowing my eyes at him. Don't act like a goddamn psycho. Look, if you keep that shit up, I'll call the cops. Don't fucking do it again. I had no patience for nut jobs like him. He always gave me the creeps. As a kid, someone had gone around pouring bleach into the eyes of people's cats and dogs, blinding them and leading to some getting euthanized. I always suspected Sloane of doing it, though he never got caught. My brother and I spent the rest of that day packing up anything we wanted to take with us, putting it in boxes and labeling it. Charlie didn't have a lot of possessions, and Mum didn't exactly have a lot of valuable items in her house, so it was fairly quick going. 
I figured I would either end up selling or donating most of the crap left behind in the end. Before I knew it, the sun had started setting again. The darkness of a moonless sky descended on Frost Hollow like a guillotine blade. My brother and I kept working, mostly in silence, though Charlie would come over and show me random objects he had recently acquired. Rick, Charlie said, proudly holding up a plush doll of Rick from Rick and Morty. A trickle of fake drool dripped Rick's mouth and a trickle of real one from Charlie's. I laughed, ruffling his hair as if he were a toddler. That's right, I answered excitedly. That's Rick. You like Rick, buddy? You like how he just does whatever he wants whenever he feels like? Charlie nodded excitedly at that. After a couple more hours of sorting, I decided to go to bed. I wanted to leave as early as possible on Sunday morning after the funeral, which was the next day. Charlie followed me like a puppy, his normally unfocused eyes flitting from one side to the other with a kind of intensity I had rarely seen there before. He constantly scanned the shadows as if looking for something. We kept all the lights in the surrounding rooms and the guest bedroom. As I lay there, about to fall asleep, I glanced over at Charlie and saw him staring straight up at the stain with wide, watery eyes. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. I don't know how long it was later when I awoke suddenly in the pitch black. I blinked quickly, confused. And then I heard it, the noise that had caused me to set up in bed. Right over me, I heard something gurgling and hissing in rhythmic breaths. It sounded as if whatever it was had lungs filled with blood and dirt. The terror I felt at that moment was incomprehensible, but it grew much worse when two burning skeletal hands reached down and grabbed me. They covered my right arm in an iron grip, the thin, blade-like fingers feeling inhumanly long. I could feel my skin burning and melting. I screamed, kicking out with my legs and trying to pull away. I brought my left hand up, grabbing blindly for the thing's face. I groped in the darkness until I felt it, a face like a skull. It was slick and wet under my touch, sticky with clotted blood. I felt the muscles of its skeletal face thrumming and contracting. The thing had no skin. I repressed an urge to scream, instead reaching for its eyes, even as its burning hands continued yanking at my arm, trying to pull me off the bed. I felt a nose that was just a ragged hole of destroyed flesh, felt the fetid breath passing softly through those mutilated patches. I reached up into its eyes, but there were no eyes there, just two empty sockets. I reached inside and felt the skittering of insect larvae under my fingers. At the back of the empty socket, my fingers groped thin strands like fleshy wires that had been severed. With all of my strength, I stuck my finger deep down into that warm, twisting socket, stabbing my fingernails into the optic nerves and vessels at the back and ripping. The hands on my arm instantly released. I felt some of the melted skin go with them, heard the tearing of my flesh as warm blood instantly dripped from the wounds. Hyperventilating, my breath hissing with pain, I fumbled in my pocket for my lighter. I brought it up, flicking it. I caught a glimpse of the thing my brother called the Bone Face Woman, her naked skeletal body running out of the room with a sickly gurgling of her diseased lungs. Overhead, the stain had turned into a real eye, a fleshy black thing that flitted over the arm with a dilated pupil. It emanated insanity, its stare glassy and inhuman. Charlie lay on the floor, his eyes open but unseeing. My breath caught in my throat, the burning agony in my arm temporarily forgotten. I ran toward my brother, kneeling down over his limp body and shaking him. I saw fresh burn marks in the shape of a hand on his face, covering his forehead and temples. The cracked, broken flesh dribbled pus and blood, like thick, clotted tears down his cheeks. When he didn't respond, I shook him again, grabbing him by the chin and forcing his eyes to meet mine. I saw him blink. He inhaled like a drowning man, grabbing my hand tightly and shaking his head from side to side. She was here, he whispered. 
She is dead, Dennis. She lives in the dirt. We need to get out of here and never come back, I said, trying to pull Charlie up. He was far too heavy. Can you get up, buddy? Come on, we'll leave now. With great difficulty, Charlie pulled himself up. His eyes started watering as the weeping burn marks continuously dripped a rainbow of clotted fluids. I took out my phone, trying to call for help, but nothing was working in the house anymore. The electricity had gone off, which was why the lights had all gone out, but that wouldn't explain why my fully charged cell phone had gone black as well. Charlie and I stumbled outside. I put him in the passenger seat of the car, deciding to get the hell out of there and never come back. But when I tried to turn the starter, the car didn't make a sound. The engine didn't even make an attempt to turn over. It's her, Charlie whispered, his face a mask of terror and pain in the darkness. The bone-faced woman wants us to stay. Well, she can go fuck herself, I spat, anger and fear mixing in a toxic sludge in my blood. I watched the house closely, seeing the curtains at the front moving. I caught an occasional glimpse of that abomination peeking out at us with her empty eye sockets and skinned face. I looked at Sloane's house, realizing I could call for help from there. He was the only neighbor within a half-mile radius. Charlie, the car's not working and I need to call for help. I'm going to go across the street and use Sloane's phone to call the cops. I want you to lock yourself in the car. Don't open the door for anyone except me or the cops. You got that? I asked, keeping a constant watch on the house, expecting the bone-faced woman to slink out after us at any moment. She is dead, Charlie said robotically. She is walking. She will not let us leave. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. After I had made sure Charlie had locked himself in the car, I sprinted over to Sloane's dark Victorian house. I ran up the porch steps, ready to start knocking frantically on the door. But as soon as I touched it, it creaked slowly open, showing a dimly light kitchen. A single oven light was turned on. I looked around in disgust. The place was filthy. Mold-covered pots and pans covered the stovetop, Drying crusts of filth covered a mountain of dishes emerging from the sink. Maggots and other insects feasted like kings here. The white reflections of glittering rat and mouse eyes peeked out at me from the corners of the room. Sloan, I called, not wanting to be too loud. Even though I wouldn't have admitted it to him, I was quite honestly terrified of Sloan Herbick. There was something off about that man. I left the kitchen moving to the living room. There was only a single nightlight in here. All around me loomed naked human skins nailed to the wall. They rose in two rows, the bottom row offset from the top by a few feet so that more of the space could be used. I crept closer with wide eyes, realizing that the vast majority were just latex or silicone. Not all of them, however. Stuck randomly among the fake hanging skins were some that looked different. These looked thicker and had soft ridges running over their surface. I even saw signs of belly buttons, tattoos and nipples on these leathery skins. At that moment, I knew without a doubt that they were human. Many looked ancient and cracked, the leather falling apart at the shoulders or waist. There was a couch covered in what looked like gore in the center of the room, facing a TV and DVD player. On a small wooden table next to it, lay a phone and a blood-encrusted meat cleaver. Shaking with excitement and fear, I crept closer to them, immediately grabbing the weapon. I took Sergeant Alvarez's card from my pocket, calling it. She answered on the second ring, sounding tired. Hello, she said, Sergeant Alvarez speaking. This is Dennis Benton, I whispered furtively. I need help immediately. Send an ambulance and police to my mother's house at 332 Angel Trace Road. Something's happened. Where are you right now? she asked. I'm, I'm at my neighbor's across the street, but there's, like, body parts everywhere. I think he might be a serial killer. I don't know what the fuck's going on here, but please hurry. 
I gently put the phone back down on the cradle, hearing a floorboard creak behind me. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Sloan Herbig stood there, his dark eyes blazing. He pointed a pistol straight at my head. Looking down the barrel felt like looking into eternity. He was wearing a suit made of what looked like pale white human skin. It covered him from head to foot, hugging his body with precision. All of the thread and sewing marks were expertly hidden. It almost made him look like some strange alien nudist wearing a suit of white leather. At his feet, he had an open canister of gasoline. With practiced ease, he kicked it over, letting the pungent liquid spill out onto the floor all around me. Hey man, you don't have to do this, I said, trying to act calm but quivering inside. I expected him to pull the trigger at any second, and then it would be lights out forever. I've already started, he said, grinning and pointing out the window. I saw my house burning across the street. I felt the blood drain from my face as I thought about Charlie, sitting there in the car with his childlike innocence. I hoped he would know to get out in time. Why are you doing this? I asked, horrified. I never did anything to you. Everyone who looked at me did something to me, he spat. They hated me because I'm ugly and burned. But now I have a new skin, so people can't hate me anymore. I made it myself, and this face? He pointed at the dried human skin, wrapping around his head. This is my mother's. She was one of my first, but she never truly left, you see. She told me, take it, this is my body, given to you. Take my skin, take my face and my hair, and from it, make yourself a new body. Make yourself a thing of beauty, as soft and pale as winter moonlight. After I killed her, I buried her under the dirt in your house, back when it was being built. I knew they would pour the foundation the next day. All those tons of concrete covered her, took her away, and then no one ever knew what happened. He shrugged. It had to be done, to make me whole again. No mother could see her own son become a twisted, ugly thing after all. The rest of the skin mostly came from prostitutes. I find female skin is much softer, more malleable, and easier to work with. They also take better care of their skin than men. He laughed softly at this. Okay, so you've already finished your suit, I said, sweating heavily, so let me go. I have nothing to do with this. He smiled an insane rictus grin behind his leathery mask. I only need one more piece, and that is the soles of the feet, he answered in his cold, psychopathic way. I'll get those from you. Goodbye, Dennis. It was nice seeing you again. At that moment, Charlie stumbled in the room, his movements loud and ungraceful. Sloan turned, surprised. A heartbeat later, Charlie slammed his heavy body against Sloan's back, sending him flying. The pistol went off, the bullet missing me by inches. I heard it whiz over the top of my head and smash into the ceiling above me. Cold dread worked its way down my spine as I realized I had just missed death by inches. Sloan landed on his stomach at Charlie's feet. Screaming, Sloan put his left hand up, revealing a Zippo lighter there. He flicked it, throwing it at the pile of gasoline. I backpedaled quickly, trying to go around the blazing ball of fire and get to Sloan. Get the gun! I screamed at Charlie. Charlie looked down at Sloan with slow comprehension dawning in his face. He took one massive sneaker and stomped down on Sloan's right hand with the pistol in it. I heard the bone crack like twigs snapping. Sloan shrieked, trying to pull away, but Charlie continued leaning down on his arm, preventing him from moving it. The fire was creeping at an incredible rate, rising up the walls and across the ceiling. Thick, black smoke filled the room, suffocating us. I ran at Charlie, my eyes watering. I realized I was still holding the meat cleaver in one hand. I looked down at Sloane in his suit of human skin, still trying to raise the gun with his broken arm. I wanted to finish this quickly. I brought the knife down into the back of his neck, hearing the bone crack. 
There was a wet thud and a bubbling of blood as the meat cleaver bit deeply into through his spine, and then Sloane was still. Come on, Charlie, I said, grabbing his large hand. He wrapped his fingers around mine. Coughing and choking, we stumbled out into the night as police cars started pulling up. The first one had Sergeant Alvarez in it, who ran towards us, helping a stumbling Charlie toward the back seat of her car, where he could sit down and catch his breath. Both houses were on fire now, blazing pillars of flame that rose high into the black, starless sky. At that moment, I only hoped that the flames would eat away the corpse of Sloane's mother, the bone-face woman. 